It's great to have uh, have you all with us again for this post COP roundtable event, being hosted by the Renewable Energy Institute. Um, for those of you that uh, are having the repeat performance after our pre COP event, this is a, our opportunity to have a digest of what the world's uh, leaders and their advisors have discussed, uh, the distilled wisdom that's come out from the event, and um, we pulled together our uh, spectacular panel of. Uh, uh, knowledgeable experts in the field to to have a discussion really uh, about what we thought about that COP event, um, what we did well, what we did uh, less well, uh, and where we might go in future. So it's a great pleasure to have the company again of John Wilson, Bill Senior, Scott Sklar, and Rohit Sen, um, and they're, they're going to be taking a few questions. Um, and if during the course of the event you've got other questions you want to raise, please do use the chat facility and um, we'll do our best to circle back and get those answered. So we're going to move straight into to a discussion uh, about the uh, the event. And prior to the event, the, uh, the, the president of COP26, Alok Sharma, he said, Paris promised Glasgow must deliver. What did COP26 and the Glasgow Pact deliver is the question I have. What are the real positive takeaways? And in particular, looking at the, the renewable energy and low carbon sector, what did we get uh, out of this particular event? And I'd like to turn to Rohit, first of all, um, to give us some thoughts on that. And then we'll work through the group to see uh, what are the perspectives uh, we can gather. So Rohit, what's your thoughts on, on um, did we deliver or not? Hi, uh, John. Thank you. And good at you all. Um, yeah, I mean, this is a quite an uh, interesting question. And uh, as, I, as many have noted, that the final agreement called the Glasgow Climate Pact failed to capture the emergency mode that the moment called for as even as it incrementally moved forward uh, in climate actions uh, in several areas. But let's take a moment and we know that much happened in the first two weeks of December at COP26 in Glasgow. We have seen moments of hope, doubts, frustration, action, inaction, answers and questions and even more questions. But most of all, we've experienced the need for community and collective coordinated action for the renewable sector especially at a time where the world is burning more fossil fuels than ever before, and the industry received six times more COVID uh, recovery funds than renewable energy in 2020. As we near the end of uh, 2021 and get to the other side of COP26, the need of the hour is to join forces and advance collective action and drive change well into the future and make renewables front and center of the change. On the sidelines, even though um, even though the Glasgow Climate Pact did not specifically mention renewables energy, but on the sidelines, what I have noted down from my side, that more than 130 nations have made net zero commitments, necessitating, necessitating local climate action and energy action. More than 200 local and regional uh, governments signal their interest uh, to commit towards 100% renewables. And, and worldwide, we have seen that there's already more than 800 cities with renewable energy targets, more than 700 uh, cities that we have now uh, who have committed to net zero commitments, and more than 600 cities who are actually having targets for 100% renewable. So that all this being said and listed, that, that renewables will play an important and key role and would be the cornerstone of uh, SDG 7 and also uh, moving towards 2050 net zero emissions targets. I mean, just if I could, in the meantime, um, add another few things. I mean, we have we have seen uh, some nations um, already, countries uh, who are putting uh, net zero uh, commitments, um, which I noticed very interestingly. So far, only two countries in the world uh, who have achieved this net zero emissions successfully. One being Bhutan, and the other being Suriname. Of course, two very small uh, countries uh, with respect to magnitudes of other, it's like the China and India's and the United States of the world. But nevertheless, what is interesting to note that even for Bhutan, who, which which basically is a carbon sink rather than being net zero, is a rather than it is rather negative. Um, even though they have uh, demand comparatively less and uh, also a good forest cover of 70%, the percentage of renewable energy in their electricity mix was more than 82%. So therefore, we need to note that, that renewable energy is playing a key role in, in uh, the, uh, you know, the climate uh, change mitigation and for achieving overarching targets like net zero emissions. 
Wow, um, that's a huge amount of information in, in that digest. Um, really interesting. Um, I'm just going to throw that straight over to, to our panel, um, just for some further reviews and, and thoughts on that. John, um, and any comeback on what uh, Rohit has, has put in there? Yeah, I think there's uh, there's a few issues there that are, are promising. Um, it's, uh, I suppose, overall people are disappointed that governments didn't come out with big statements. Um, a lot of it is motherhood statements of things that are good and we all agree with. Um, perhaps one of the great things is that there doesn't seem to be any longer the, the questioning over climate change and uh, humanity's uh, role in creating that. So that seems to be pretty well out apart from a, a few skeptics, but uh, that's good news. Yes, the statements are very general, but hidden behind the, the good news perhaps that carbon is being phased out with coal and fewer emissions from uh, methane and so on, hidden behind that of course is how you're going to achieve it. And I think that's the bit that was missing that we would all have expected to have at least some general statements from governments on that. Uh, as far as I can see, it's certainly true that uh, there isn't up front that plan, but there is a lot more behind that I'll talk about later, perhaps. So okay. it's good news that the big problem has been recognised. It's maybe not such good news that at the moment there aren't detailed plans, although we know that uh, countries are supposed to come back in a year with their plans. Right. That's, uh, that's good. Um, so, Bill, over to you. Uh, and I'm sure, you know, focus on the carbon, perhaps. The carbon. Yeah. yeah. Well, look, I mean, the, the, the year of COP26, you have to see it as a totality. I mean, the event was two weeks of, I don't know what it was like in other parts of the world, but in the UK, it was nonstop, huge news coverage of climate change, the options, the issues, uh, continuous. And, and I was really taken that people that I come in contact with that, you know, in other circles of my life, other than the, the low carbon sphere, started talking about it, saying, oh, we've really got to do something about that. And did you know such and such? And did you know that? And, and so, you know what, you have to look at the totality. So there's this COP27, you know, 197 countries try to get together to agree something in two weeks, it's going to be disappointing. And it, you know, every time there's a, a declaration from these COP meetings, they, they disappoint at the end. And this one uh, lived up to that. Um, but, you know, there was a huge amount of other stuff going on. There were other uh, inter-country agreements, there were sectoral agreements, uh, um, individual countries have updated their NDCs. I mean, in sort of prepping for this, I, I read that 90% of the world now has net zero targets, and um, that covers 80% of global emissions. Now, what I've seen in the UK is when we signed net zero into law here, we started seriously thinking about how to decarbonize the whole economy. And, you know, there's a huge role for renewables uh, starting in the power sector. Um, we know we can electrify the transport sector, and then we need these other tools uh, in addition uh, to reach net zero uh, by decarbonizing heat and industry. Uh, with CCS and hydrogen and renewables, uh, and eventually to deliver the net part as we decarbonize the final sector. So, um, you know, think of it at different levels. The other bit that I was very taken by was the, the level of commitment from uh, industry and international corporations and um, many uh, actions and activities. Now, what's, what's next to deliver is, is the action bit that John mentioned, and that needs policy and finance and uh, uh, organizations to implement both renewables and other low carbon energies. Fantastic. Thanks for that, Bill. Now, I'm, I'm going to throw this one uh, in, into the uh, hands of Scott for I know, what I know will be an, an interesting response. Uh, we're talking here about the positive outcomes, but also just the lack of clarity as to where renewables and low carbon technologies fit. 
disappointment from the the outcomes of COP, Scott, or are you happy with it? Um, actually, neither. Uh, <laughs> I had very uh, low expectation, and I'll tell you uh, two reasons. One is that um, we're we're still in a post uh, or a, uh, let's say a mid to end pandemic play globally. And uh, most of the nations on this planet are still struggling not only to contain COVID, but putting uh, immense uh, financial uh, commitments to deal with COVID. And at the same time, um, uh, their uh, global economies are still uh, not performing as, as uh, we had hoped. So we have the world leaders coming together uh, already running a marathon, already feeling a little poor, and uh, that took the, some of the wind out of it, I believe. I think it would have been a very different COP26 had uh, we not be going through this pandemic. So, so that sort of frames my discussion here. The second is, um, you know, nations have a lot of power, national governments, but it's really state and local governments that have to implement uh, many of the things that uh, we're, we're trying to deal with in decarbonization. So uh, they're coming together and they have their, you know, they, they want to have the right uh, public persona, but at the end, it's now we're getting to nuts and bolts since the Paris Accords. And it's a lot more difficult to get to the details uh, than just making great pronouncements. But here's what we did get. We did get an agreement over 100 countries on methane, methane a very m far more potent greenhouse gas, and that is worth something. Just before the conference, we did get an, an, a pronouncement by China saying that they're not going to be the world's financer for coal plants. And they financed 72% of the world's coal plants in the past few years. So if they stick to that commitment, that actually is a pretty solid win. And, and I, I do think uh, the, the sort of co-pronouncement co by the U.S. and China that instead of being uh, 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 adversaries on every issue, which is, I believe, sad, uh, that on this issue we really are going to try to cooperate. And I, I do want to remind people, I do love the T-shirt the environmental groups uh, put out saying there's no planet two. And that's true. This is our boat. We're all on it, whether we like it or not. And we have to be uh, grown-ups and get along together. So I do think, and then I, I want to add the, the previous uh, comment that the private sector, I think, has uh, really uh, decided that they need to be prime actors, and frankly, they do. And so I've seen some interesting pronouncements, obviously, from the global banks. I've seen some interesting pronouncements by uh, the, the meat packers, and, uh, and so we have different sub-segments of, um, of, of industry saying uh, we're going to row together a little bit here and try to do it as a team, and that's also very important and very needed. So did it mean my expectations? Absolutely not. Did I understand what was going on in and, uh, and, and this pallor of COVID? Absolutely. And I think we got the best of what we could get. So that's my take. That's fantastic. Thank you to our, our panelists for that, th those insights. Really, really helpful. Uh, and that was, you know, kind of a, a start of a ten as we really get into some some more of the substance now uh, of the uh, the COP twenty six. So I think um, come back to you, Scott. Um, you know, we talked about the positives out there. Could they have done more? What would you have really liked to have seen from this? I guess what I would have liked to see is um, some more uh, in, uh, initiatives relating to capital formation. We have half the planet that, frankly, just does not have the money or capability to retool their economies. And I do want to point out that, you know, there are always some that when I say things like that, they go, oh, my gosh, you know, welfare. No, uh, the industrialized countries have much to gain in new markets with their industries to to drive that reindustrialization and so that's going to mean uh you know green banks and green bonds and and you know uh use some of the tools we already have that are clunky 
out of the World Bank, for instance. But at the same time, uh, you know, we have had some positive impacts and the development banks uh, as well have some regional development banks have had some great impacts. And we, I think, just needed a sort of a global meeting like we had in creating the United Nations and the World Bank group to uh, create these uh, stronger green institutions that can funnel dollars economically, but with speed, due speed in decarbonization. And I just didn't see that. And I was hoping that um, uh, that's something that I, the industrialized world could sort of team around. And I just felt that that was a missed opportunity. Yeah, I, I agree with everything you're saying there. And in particular, this, this whole issue of financing and, and the fact we've got, whether it's a north-south divide or you know, developed versus underdeveloped, so many opportunities. I think we, we could have done far more uh, at this event. But interesting, you know, talking about finance in particular, other panelists perhaps turn to Rohit. Uh, any, anything from your side uh, that you felt was you know, fund fundamentally missing from the discussion? I mean, uh, in my opinion, John, I think uh, the point on finance was uh, something which needed to come out even more strongly. I mean, um, look at something that was promised to uh, the developing countries by the de developed nations of uh, billions of dollars per year it never happened. And now uh, we are at a certain point where uh, we are asking everyone to increase their ambition, increase the level of transition and action, but the funding still remains the same. I mean, I believe uh, everybody would be interested with their economic development um, and so on. At the same time, fight, uh, fight climate uh, change, which is happening. And uh, recently we hear things happening in British Columbia and Vancouver. Uh, so this finance part needs to be addressed and access and implementation and investment of it needs to also become a reality. As of now, I do not see any nation which has said, um, you know, strongly, oh, we have access to finance and we are super happy with it. Everybody is complaining. We haven't seen the flows. We haven't seen the investment. So we are seeing everybody struggling. So this mm -hmm. needs to increase and needs to flow. Okay. Uh, Bill, anything to add on that one? Yeah, I mean, there's still some imbalances in the world, aren't there? There sort of doesn't feel like there's a... The equity issue is still lurking there first and foremost between the, the developing and developed and the south and the north and this transfer of finance and capability that's, uh, and, and enabling clean development in uh, emerging economies is really important. I, I wasn't sure whether China was there or not, you know, in the meeting. It just felt like they were sort of on the sidelines. And and China, you know, I, I acknowledge what Scott said. They did make some declarations up front, but we don't really know where they stand. And if China, with its huge sort of emissions, uh, is still talking about peaking uh, in 2030, then that's... Um, that's a worry because you know that's uh, they have such a big uh, role in the solution and uh, in society. So that that feels like it's it's not wasn't quite engaged. I don't know. I wasn't there, but um, so there's 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 still a lot of big geo geopolitics seem to overshadow a lot of it, and and the world just feels like it's sort of. There's some destabilizing influences in the geopolitics, and perhaps they're getting in the way of uh, working towards this sort of global solution that we need. Okay. Yeah, that, that's a, I want to just uh, jump in and say that's a great insight, and I, I felt the exact same way, and I'm glad you articulated it. There's, because there's so, there's so much other drama going on, uh, you know, uh, the, the natural gas issues between Russia and the Europeans, the, the little kerfuffle on who, who has the more uh, bigger muscles between China and the U.S. Uh, there's all that going on, uh, rising global gasoline prices as well as natural gas. So there are a lot of other issues uh, in addition to COVID that I mentioned earlier that seem to be in play there and temper uh, what could have happened. Okay. John, uh, I've not had a chance to hear, hear from you on this point yet. You know, what, what was the letdown for you in all of this? 
Yeah, maybe a, a comment on the on the financing as well. I mean, mm. there have been one or two good things coming out. I think what people perhaps were hoping was that all this massive spending on the on the COVID uh, problems could be shifted to this problem as well. It's not the way it happens. You know, we print lots of money, we solve one problem, and everything stops, and then things start again, and you have to build up momentum. I mean, that is possibly an opportunity that that shift should, should be going to energy efficiency and green hydrogen. Uh, there'd be one or two hints that funds are starting out in a big way, and if they're held to, they could make a difference. Um, I think there's a, a Global Energy Alliance, which was launched just recently by the Rockefeller Foundation and uh, Bezos and some of the banks and IKEA, uh, IKEA. That was something like 100 billion US dollars, and it's um, a combination of public and private financing that's supposed to reach a billion people with renewable energy um, and create a lot of jobs. So all of that is is positives, but uh, it's all tucked away on the sidelines. I think, as Scott said earlier, it's what's going on in the background that is so much more important often than these political games than what people will agree to up front. So maybe we, we do have to look behind that, as we're intending to do in the next questions, uh, to see what really has been going on behind where people have been discussing and not posturing. OK, well, let's dig into that a little bit. You know, in particular, let's focus on you know, renewable energy. Um, you know, we were focused on the, the fact that there was very little in there directly, which, which says renewable energy is going to play a, a substantial place in, in the solution um to uh, our, our climate woes what do you think we can draw from from cop 26 john that's going to really inspire the, the renewable community that we're all part of yeah obviously the, the various organizations national international on renewables whether it's uh, a particular technology like wind or pv or batteries or green hydrogen or whether it's a broader base they undoubtedly are talking much more uh, confidently now they can see that that is going to take play a part and one of the documents that has come out from the un uh, maybe not in the major thing but there is um, actually a, an energy action plan that the UN, un climate change document that provides an energy action plan and includes ways in which it will be tackled if people agree to implement this uh, it recognises that sustainable energy solutions um, are critical. They have to be used uh, for accelerating recovery from COVID as well and resilience. And also they recognise that uh, if we're decarbonising power, which has been agreed, you've got to underpin that by really aggressive efficiency measures and ambitious deployment of renewables, which is all good news to the renewable energy industry that it is ambition now. Uh, there'll be a number of cycles over my lifetime of renewables coming in, being a little bit uh, <laughs> tainted by uh, the companies that have invested in it, perhaps, and they said, oh, it's just a ploy by the oil companies, they're just playing with it. This is for real now, it really is for real, so that's good news. Um, there's a number of things that could happen from that. We have to have the money, as we've said, to spend on it. We probably still need more publicity from these specialist organisations about what renewable really is. Um, I don't mean the technology so much, but people are still maybe in general when you talk to them and say, oh, yes, you want to do this and do that and stop that. But where's the electricity going to come from? There isn't quite the connection made by individuals as to how much you can actually generate. And we make the mistake of talking about gigawatts and terawatt hours and so on. Uh, there's a lot to be said for the way that Mackay wrote his uh, Sustainable Energy Without Hot Air, putting it down to the simple units that people can understand. So there's a great deal of really good publicity that could come out from these organisations to convince people that this, this isn't second best. This is a genuine alternative that we have to use and we have to accelerate it. So that's something that I think is helping the renewable energy industry. But also, they do have to help themselves a bit. And maybe the other thing that can come in, perhaps tell you later, is we're going to need a massive amount of training. There's a big workforce going to be needed to implement these new technologies on the scale that's needed. But that's sort of getting into the nitty gritty. 
Oh, that's uh, absolutely fine, John. And I am pleased that you mentioned skills and training because that's, uh, that's something I'm personally involved in uh, quite actively as well. And recognising that the, the not necessarily new jobs, but transitions jobs, where we're taking a lot of skills that we already have uh, and repurposing people so they can continue to enjoy their livelihoods. But I think also, you know, just to your point about you know the being ambitious, how we can use that ambition to help in these uh, developing economies where you know it, it's a green light for renewables now. Um, that is going to uh, create wealth. It's going to create employment in in some of these <coughs> nations that, that have uh, you know here to you know, up to this point um, struggled to some extent. Um, so, yeah, very, very valid point, and thank, thank you for making that one. Uh, I'm going to go to Rohit now. Um, um, we're talking about being ambitious now. Um, did you, do you see ambition? Do you, do you see that ambitiousness coming through from, from this um, COP event? I mean, I, I would be wrong in saying no, no and not at all. Yes, you can ask if it is uh, the, the expectation that you and everybody else uh, was having. Uh, so as I said, the expectation was high because we are in emergency mode and that ambition did not reflect that. But nevertheless, there was ambition, as I mentioned in the beginning as well, that we had a lot of countries now committing towards net zero emissions. So that therefore, that is an addition. Uh, before the COP began, it was only 40 odd nations who had committed to net zero emissions by 2050 or later. But now we have more than 130 countries and, and we have also had many sub-national governments, local governments who have now committed to 100% renewables as well, you know, to, to live up to their uh, SDG 7, to, to net zero emissions, to local climate and energy action plans and so on. So therefore, I do see it, of course, um, on, on, on uh, practical ways, every nation and then their sub-national governments need to align this with uh, the realities, you know, uh, what also the population wants with respect to development, with respect to um, access to energy, access to clean cooking, access to finance, and so on, and most important, economic development. And not just finance, you've got to also understand that a lot of countries, a lot of them, especially in the global south, also uh, struggles with technology and, and rightly mentioned skills before, uh, you know. So this technology transfer needs to happen. And unless and until those kind of things are there, available at the very forefront of your door, how is this ambition and then commitments going to turn into actions? Mm -hmm. Okay. Bill, um, I know you're a man of considerable ambition. Uh, ambitious or not is the question. Um, I think, you know, I explained in the last session, I work mainly in the area of carbon capture and storage and hydrogen. All right. I don't work in renewables per se on a day to day basis, but my observation looking in on renewables is that renewable power in these wind and solar power are mainstream technologies for new generation uh, and they're cost effective and they're economic and they're the sort of in many areas, they're going to be the first choice in coming to market for, for new power capacity. Uh, that combined with the phase down of coal are the two big levers, well, are two of the bigger levers for early decarbonization. You know, we need to do this thing quickly and urgently. 2030 is, is, is not very far out. And we need to, if we're going to reach these uh, climate ambitions, we've got to start reducing global emissions in that time frame, and, and we're not on that trajectory. I think renewables is, you know, those are the more economic solutions for decarbonization of power. And then we've got electrification of transport coming along that looks like it it may become economic uh, on, a, on a competitive basis with, with fossil uh, fired vehicles shortly. And then the other things are, are, are harder and slightly more expensive. In my area of CCS and in the area of hydrogen, we've seen a huge expansion of ambitions and plans in the last uh, in the last year in particular. And you know that's in the lead up to COP. Uh, you know, it, just before COP, there were some huge plans from Saudi Arabia and the likes that were okay. On the one hand, you could say, well, that will free them up to produce more. 
uh, oil and gas for, for marketing. But if they can decarbonize their whole economy through a, a renewables, which is, seems to be the essence of their plan, that's a huge sort of transformation. So I, I'm, I'm optimistic in some of those areas and particularly for renewables. Um, Brilliant. Okay. Uh, John, anything to add to that? No, I don't think I have at the moment. That's right. Uh, in, in which case, uh, we'll move on. And you have to excuse me. I'm going to read out this, this next question uh, verbatim. Uh, and it goes as follows. Clause 88 of the Glasgow Climate Pact recognises the important role of non-party stakeholders, including civil society, indigenous peoples, local communities, youth, children, local and regional governments and other stakeholders in contributing to progress towards the goals of the Paris Agreement. Right, that's the end of the, the clause. How can individuals contribute towards the goals of the Paris Agreement? Big question, and I'm looking for a big answer now, John. <laughs> yeah, it is a big question. Um, it really comes down to uh, individual choice, doesn't it, as to... Uh, how much you, you want to buy into this and how much you say it's uh, perhaps our generation say, well, it's not really for us to solve. We made a mess of it. It's for the next generation, but that's not good enough. Uh, some of these technical documents have actually addressed what, if you like, civil, civil society can do. Uh, there are things you can do as an individual which we should continue to do, uh, even down to the level of we should really be buying energy efficient appliances. We shouldn't be buying stuff just because it looks good or it works well. There is a choice. So there's all sorts of individual things could be done. Um, but it's beyond that, isn't it? Um, those of us who understand some of the technology, understand that uh, the new ideas are actually not just ideas but are workable, should perhaps be promoting them a lot more. Uh, we should be telling people that these are not questionable techniques, they are real answers. We should be countering some of the bad science that is barely scientific as to why we should be doing other things. Uh, we should be entering the debate on nuclear energy, which sometimes is just treated as the bad boy. We should be looking at that properly. Um, I think as well, as a community, there should be more of an option for communities to work towards uh, their own electrical systems, since we're mainly talking about electricity, it's not entirely. And the way, as I mentioned last time, some of the, the Scandinavian communities can actually own and control their own power systems locally. Um, as soon as you're responsible for something, you take much greater care of it. And we could be doing that. Now, not every community uh, is able to do that, Small island communities could do it. Some parts of the world, they are forced to do this already. But there is probably now much greater opportunity in developed countries as well as others to just take control of these ourselves and to push a lot more for decision making as well as owning the, uh, the technology and the infrastructure. And I believe that that is on the, the action plan for leading up to um, years ahead. Uh, that has all sorts of goals for 2025, 2030, 2040. Part of that undoubtedly is that there should be a greater say from people as to what decisions are made. Don't leave it to central government. That's Fantastic. too slow a process. Don't just wait for the elections to push your vote. Thank you. So um, I'm just, just following the chat here. There's a comment that uh, uh, has come in, uh, a question on or response to the question, and it says, search for Lars Berlin in the combination to the Paris Proof Plan and see how I've got a home fossil free in a few small steps. So that's an individual demonstrating uh, how they can uh, fully decarbonize their, uh, their lifestyle, which is yeah, brilliant. I, I'll certainly have a look for that uh, after this event. Rohit, I'd like to turn to you. Um, because I know uh, individuals and communities are a, a key part of, of the world that you are very, very active in. Uh, anything to add to, to what John said, particularly from your own experiences? Um, yes, I mean, what I can add is that uh, I'm, I'm basically uh, at, uh, where I'm working with uh, many offices in, in various regions of the world. We are addressing the need of uh, and supporting uh, the local governments, so basically municipalities, cities, and so on, 
Um, but at the same time, do we we do see that the youth, the children, the civil societies, I think the kickoff here would be for them to address through change in behavior and the choices that they make and choices that we make. And that could be only influenced through various policies at not only at national level, at, at local level as well. And how those policies and, and regulations so, uh, and so on influence the choices that we make. No? So for example, if today somebody is looking at buying a car and uh, the whole youth is and, and younger generation wants to buy an SUV, SUV um, I don't think that's a very good choice and, and the behavior needs to change to buying uh, maybe an e-bike or something like that to an e-vehicle perhaps, but are they being empowered to do so? If not, are they being empowered uh, and, and giving, given the choice to use uh, public transport, for example? Yeah? So that, that needs to kick off and, and certain conscious choices and behaviors need to change from, from these uh, stakeholders as well. Uh, and I think then it would be much easier to look at this transition and address the climate change. Okay. Oh, good perspectives there. Uh, finally, Bill, you know, you know, I'm coming to you next. Um, interested to get your take on this as well, please. Yeah, it's a well. We've all got to be involved. I'm, I presume everybody on this call is working in this space, all right, and interested in it. So we all have a role because we probably know more than many other people, although we don't know everything, to actually get out there and and help educate people when you know. I, I've sort of um, was approached by some colleagues locally who said, oh, we need a local climate group and, and um, what can we do, you know, and who knows about heat pumps and who knows about buying an EV and who knows about this and that. And this knowledge is there in some people in the communities. We need to, we need to work with people to sort of at all levels to embrace this thing in, in all parts of our life. Um, so especially, you know, what bugs me most is when people, you know, when you buy things, when you buy a car or when you build something in your house, you're making a capital investment that has an emissions footprint for 10, 15, 20 years. You need to make choices if you can afford them for something that's got a lower footprint, either because it's smaller or because it's electric, if you can afford that or it's... Uh, it's totally insulated if it's a building project. And I, I don't hear people saying that. I see people carrying on their day-to-day -day lives and uh, bugging me when they turn up in a big SUV to talk about climate change. But, but there we are. We, we've got to do it and we've got to get involved individually. I, you know, well, we can. When, when we're in a business situation, you know, we know now that we can do a lot more with Zoom than by flying around the place and meeting people face to face, much as we love to go to uh, interesting and different places and meet people face to face. We've got to sort of embrace these things and champion uh, the lower carbon lifestyle. Politicians are not going to tell people to change their behaviours because it's not a vote winner. So... You know, people in the know need to be the champions, local champions. And uh, yeah, yeah, all of us. Absolutely. Thanks for that, Bill. I know, to, to be honest, every gram of uh, emissions or carbon that we, we don't emit uh, is a step in the right direction right now. And that's largely down to ourselves as individuals, how we manage our lives and our lifestyles. And I, I you know... Uh, whether I take this number with a pinch of salt, I did hear that we could solve 50% of our emissions simply by managing ourselves. Um, whether it's it is 50%, whether it's even 10%, just that you know behavior changes individuals. That's a phenomenal amount of emissions mm -hmm. just by uh, using you know, less heating, boiling less water, driving less you know miles in our cars. Uh, all these things do have you know, important steps to take, and uh, I. I have fond memories of my, my grandparents who had a little savings box that uh, had on the side of it, great oaks from little acorns will grow. And I think that's kind of an, an appropriate uh, um, uh, little, little epithet to, to, to add into the, uh, the discussion. So um, in the absence of Scott, and I'm really sad that he, he's been unable to, uh, to rejoin, hopefully we'll get, get him back on before we finish. 
Uh, I'm going to go to one of the questions um, that's come in from the chat. Um, and the question is, how does the collective action of governments compare to the individual action of entrepreneurs who are working to solve the problem? Collectiveness or creativity, which has the greatest likelihood of delivering a practical answer? Now, it's not you know, a specific um, you know, COP question. However, that there's a key part of this, which is about innovation. It's about entrepreneurs. And our renewables world is absolutely full of people like this, isn't it? So um, um, this is into the lion's den here because none of you had a chance to prepare uh, a response to this. So, John, you're smiling at me. I'll let you have a crack at this. But really, I think the, 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 the approach to this is COP26 has done what it's done. Um, renewables haven't got the, the, the largest amount of press that we might have liked uh, from the outcomes from that. But there is still this huge community of entrepreneurs. Do we think there are some positives for that creative spirit? Yeah, I think it's absolutely essential. Um, we're going to have to beat this massive scale up in installations. I mean, just, just in my area, in PV alone, uh, massive scale up worldwide. There's still a lot of innovation there in uh, all the way down to the, the sort of individual wafers, right back up to the panels and the way they're run, the way they're managed, the way they're uh, reviewed as to performance. There's a lot of things even in that field, and that's just expanded across the rest. So certainly entrepreneurs have got an enormous part to play. Uh, we also have, of course, at the moment, in several of these areas like PV, we have basically a Chinese monopoly. You know, we've let that get away from us. Um, we're talking about switching massively to newer technologies. Europe if we leave out the US for the moment, I'm sure Scotland would give a similar story. But in Europe, there's an intention to try and manufacture more. It's beginning in PVs, it's beginning in batteries. Um, I think the ambition of the EU at the moment is that uh, they would be second to China in uh, battery manufacturer, manufacture by about 2025. Now, batteries alone are not a fully mature subject yet. There's a lot there. There's room for entrepreneurs in the whole link between electricity, PV, wind, electric vehicle charging and storage. At the moment, I think we've got something like 60 gigawatt hours of storage in EVs, in electric vehicles around the world. Uh, sorry, in Europe. So in Europe alone, 2 million electric vehicles, that's a lot of storage. It's not being manipulated properly at the moment. At the moment, I think, entrepreneurs and small investors are more interested in setting up charge points, but I think it goes beyond that. Um, there's, there's quite a lot of possibilities for technology there, I think. At the same time, perhaps we shouldn't forget also just the whole business of insulating and making things more efficient. Lots of niches there for making uh, houses more efficient, insulating them, appliances more efficient. And we've seen that with a few uh, really headline entrepreneurs with uh, their inventions that are now on the market. So yeah, that's certainly needed. They're the only people going to make it work. Governments won't make it work. They might help by certain tax regimes to encourage people to invest in that, but it really does need these bright ideas to actually come out and be transferred into products. Brilliant, thanks for that. So Bill, uh, entrepreneurs, do we, do we need this bottom up approach, a top down approach, both? I don't think government. I think government is just a blocker for entrepreneurs. I, I think. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's uh, you know, private innovation. We need you know. There's there's massive opportunities here. I mean, part of the um, part of the outcome and the changing context is that as this gets more widely embraced as the main you know, decarbonization and energy transition is 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 at part of the the direction of travel for the world, and that creates huge opportunities to those who are commercially minded and and entrepreneurs in the areas of deployment and uh, technology and innovation. And and obviously, you know, the world is also this, the whole digital world is moving faster than any of us can imagine. And, and smart um, management of energy use and emissions use is going to be uh, an integral part of every, everyone's life. So absolutely. In, um, 
the, the, I see these sort of, you know, Bill Gates has got this fund. Uh, and I think there's a role for all of these. You know, they're sort of trying to back some technologies that are facing the valley of death that, uh, that need additional money to be sort of demonstrated and brought to market at scale. And, and all of these things have a role. I, I think when it comes to innovation, it's probably better if governments take a back seat and provided they hand out a bit of money uh, in a sensible way to innovators and researchers and developers. I think that's, that's, that's probably better if they're out of the way mainly. We, need, we do need the right incentives and policies for uh, the new things that uh, need to be brought to market. Brilliant. Um, so I'm going to turn to you, Rohit, on this question of uh, entrepreneurs, innovation, uh, and perhaps to bring this back to you know the, the COP26 outcomes, do we think COP26 has enabled, empowered our creative community, including that the the, you know, the academic community, which is huge across the world, this great source of ideas and knowledge that we've got? Did did we achieve anything with COP26 to support this? I, I think there is potential. I mean, I, I don't. I won't say that there is immediate action oriented that that you know, that you one can take away from it. There is potential, there has been directions laid out. Now it of course depends on each stakeholder, how they put it from the national government to the to the individuals and, and, and people on, on, you know, in every country, every region and so on. So, um, and, and then speaking on the other topic that you were talking about, I think everybody has a role to play from the national government to the local government, to the entrepreneurs and so on. And uh, bottom up approach is very much needed in this case. It cannot be just one uh, top-down approach. Uh, it is important to have these checks and balances. That's the reason why entrepreneurs are important and, and governments are important as well. Um, on the point of um, technologies, I don't think only innovation with technologies will solve the problem here. We need, also need uh, innovation with application and solutions that includes both business models, how you implement, how you utilize frugal solutions if needed, and so on. No? Um, so hence, um, I think going forward, all these things are important. And I believe uh, everybody from, from the private sector to the, the public sector, to the academia, everybody has a role to play and, and join hands together to, to get this delivered. Nobody has more important role than the other. And at the same time, it doesn't affect anybody seeing what, which sector they come from. And the climate change would take everybody up together. So we need to be together and, and facing this uh, crisis situation. Thank you. Brilliant. Okay, thank you. So um, we have got time to put uh, to, to field just a couple more questions. If anyone has got uh, anything specific that they, they want us to uh, venture our uh, humble opinions on, there's a really interesting point that's come in, um, which, uh, just bear with me, I'll just scroll up to the question here. And it's, it's about energy use and efficiency and in, indeed the role of cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin mining and how that's uh, impacting the world's electricity demand. Uh, and whilst I haven't seen um, you know, a specific clause in the outcomes of the COP26 relating to that, interested to know from our panel, um, uh, any uh, you know, views, opinions, you know, is, is this a good thing to be doing? Are the outcomes from cryptocurrencies going to help us uh, put money where it's, it's needed? Or is this in fact a colossal waste of time and effort that's actually contributing uh, to unnecessary global warming. So, uh, yeah, Rohit, as, as you're on screen at the moment, quick comment on this one. I mean, it's it's difficult to assess like this because, uh, of course, it's it's uh, breaking uh, the let's say the shells or the shackles of the normal financial flows. Um, I think some uh, projects have been implemented which are very innovative uh, in, in, in a way to deal with this cryptocurrency. Um, and, and of course, in a, uh, now whether this takes the commercial form, um, it's difficult to say. I, I do not know if everybody then comes out with different cryptocurrencies or uh, would this be standardized? And then we go into another circle of uh, you know standardization and, and, and trademarks and all those things. Uh, I mean, it is interesting to see how it works. Um, it, it has an impact, but nevertheless, then we, everybody, all the stakeholders in the sector needs to come behind it and agree on it. 
because as long as we waste time in agreeing and disagreeing we are again losing out on something important but nevertheless that being said we are still yet to see uh, you know uh, ground breaking impact that and 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 people adapting to this from the local level up yeah not just the one sitting in let's say the european offices or the american offices okay anyone else on the panel want to, to have a chat about cryptocurrencies whilst we're, we're on the case I don't really know. Where does it happen? I mean, it's one of those things that's virtual and, you know, where is it? Um, yeah, it, it seems like it's an issue um, and it's not clear to me who owns it and who's going to control it. But, yeah. Okay. No. Right. Um, and anything to add, John, before I, I move into a, what, a two final questions? Yeah, it's only well, can, can it actually be converted into into action into real um, uh, to, to real objects uh, that's what i'm still not sure about how much is it just a gambling trick certainly yeah. the security aspect of spreading this across where people can't interrupt it is is a great idea we know that works with blockchain methods for control of uh, ai and so on that's that's very technical stuff i just don't understand how the crypto one really is working it, it doesn't seem to be based on any underlying value so it's whether mm. it can generate anything i just okay. don't understand it's it should be possible to use that but i don't understand how okay right um so i saw you look uh, lots and lots of things coming back in um on the questions here which i'm, I'm really pleased to see here um so I've got a question here about, it's an agricultural one, uh, and it's as follows. The UK has pledged to engage 75% of farmers in low-carbon practices by 2030. And this is a bit of a brainstorm. Uh, we've not done a question like this before. What existing or innovative technologies may be required for this? And I think this, this is something that has got global Im implications. If we think about the impact of nitrate fertilizers and pollution, perhaps, if we think about shifting away from uh, diesel-powered uh, machinery to alternatives, maybe thinking as well about changes in diets for, for cattle and, and, and so on. So um, UK has made a pledge. What what learnings have we got as, as a team of uh, reasonably knowledgeable people that we could perhaps share with our uh, audience today? Bill, <laughs> wealth of experience in farming, I know you have. Oh, well, my ancestors were farmers and my cousins. Um so fertilizer is nearly all made from natural gas, I believe. I Correct. don't know very much about it. Some of the opportunities uh, I've seen people working on are to hinder fertilizer from natural gas production. A lot of CO2 emissions are produced, and this is one of the areas of potential for carbon capture and storage. Um, and it's a relatively inexpensive stream of CO2 emissions that could be abated at, uh, you know, less than 30 to $50 per ton of CO2. But it's obviously an additional cost for the fertilizer manufacturer, unless there's a, a policy instrument around carbon pricing or emissions to, um, that they have to face. So that's an opportunity. It's not in the, you know, it's I, 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 other than getting into agricultural practices, which I don't know the first thing about, and uh, fuel um, replacement of diesel with some sort of uh, alternative fuels. I, I, I don't know very much about this area. Okay. Uh, John? Yeah, there's been... It's, it's certainly an area of concern, isn't it? Um, it's not just uh, the large, should we call them industrial farmers, but it's the small holding farmers all around the world. Um, if you've only got a limited patch of land, you want to get the most out of it. Um, it's a different problem from the large farmers who are obviously driven with getting as much crop as possible for the money and the land is just a, a fairly sterile substrate into which you put everything needed to get a crop out. So it's quite a complicated problem. And I know that agricultural research places are looking into this and have for some time. Um, you, you can certainly 
they have the same problem as we all have with the energy supply of uh, switching over to more of an electric and green energy and that that's that's different but producing food is a major thing that we have to do um, and perhaps the only thing that does concern me is the way in which uh, the government is encouraging building over of land instead of using it for productivity in, in most developing countries um, it's happening all over are, are, are we perhaps not also slightly guilty with this john in that we're advocating renewables and we've got to put them somewhere so onshore renewables are going to go on to, to land so um, yeah um that that is something i was perhaps going to touch on so yeah sorry it reminded me no that's that's a good point um certainly the number of sites that are needed yeah um where are we going to put them all it's there's been some moderately mid-scale experiments now with pv photovoltaics that is uh and agriculture of various sorts, whether it's horticulture or whether it's uh, small scale animal farming, the two fit together quite well. Um, there's a, a lot to be gained perhaps from the shelter, the sunshade, and uh, that's being addressed technically. So that's possible. The other sites, of course, are going to impinge in some way on our waterways, whether that helps by reducing evaporation or whether it hinders by making the, uh, the water in any way, should we say, contaminated, not by pollutants, but by more abstract ideas. But certainly the sites are needed. We're going to have to put them somewhere. We're beyond the stage now of just sticking them on houses. We're having to look at massive areas and uh, not necessarily out at sea, although that's also a possibility. So yeah, it's another competition for our land. But there is at least a hint that you can combine horticulture and greenhouse uh, raising, and I think some of the aqua farming as well, with PV in a positive way. Great stuff. Uh, in terms of you know, farming, Rohit, does this does this hit your agenda very often, and how we might decarbonize that sector? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not an expert in this, but I, I know there's a lot to a uh, lot of things happening, uh, especially with this nexus <laughs> of uh, energy, water, land, and so on, with food included in it. Um, I mean, <clears throat> I have seen, um, you know, uh, John mentioned about uh, photovoltaics or agri-photovoltaics, <laughs> quite a thing that are happening and people are using different kinds of things. So I, I believe sector coupling is one area that we should look at. Um, I mean, this is, of course, now looking at power generation and agriculture and other sides of uh, where you can do sector cu coupling and, and, you know, get uh, projects implemented. But nevertheless, I mean, as new research happens and more things come out, it's difficult, uh, you know, to always be that much of uh, flexible and keep changing your plans. I mean, I recently read um, somewhere that production of rice is a concern now, uh, with with rice being uh, having high GHG emissions, using a lot of water, using land. I mean, if you take out rice, imagine uh, biggest two countries, the highest population, China and India, where, where are they going to feed from? I mean, so this is complicated. I, I do not have a straightforward answer, but yes, I, I know it's a concern. So we need to mm -hmm. figure out what to do here. So I think is, is this coming down to you know, facing, uh, dare I say, and I uh, you know, just raise it as a point, uh, I've actually reached the limit of what the planet can sustain in terms of population. And that's a rhetorical question because uh, that's quite a, a sensitive issue. Um, just to come back on one or two of the, the, the points that you, you that our panelists have, have raised, certainly when you look at um, uh, emissions that come out from fertilizer production, um, stripping out the hydrogen to go into that process, that uh, yeah, must account for approaching half of the uh, emissions uh, that come out from hydrogen production worldwide. So that, that's substantial. Um, we've also got to think about the role of the land, not just for building things on, but the fact the soil itself uh, has the, the possibility to sequester carbon naturally. That's also a part of this. Um, and it would be remiss if I didn't mention the change in lifestyle point from earlier and how we're changing our eating and dietary habits, shifting away from a meat diet to a uh, you know, more vegetarian or vegan uh, approaches to uh, obtaining our calories. So there's, there's lots and lots of things to consider, but it is a very sensitive uh, subject because ultimately we're talking about one of the, the key staples which human beings need to, to exist, uh, and that's the supply of food, isn't it? So quite a, a sensitive issue. Right, um, well, we're drawing um, close to, to the end of the, the event.
Uh, and there's two two questions, um, one of which was a question about what the Renewable Energy Institute can do to continue to help uh, educate and inform people. Um, and I'm just going to reply to this very, very directly to say that on this uh, call are some of the experts who do get involved in delivering uh, activities on behalf of the Renewable Energy Institute. There are a full range of courses offered to help educate and inform and develop skills. That's a, a range of courses that is expanding. And please, if you want more information on the Institute, uh, please uh, email in, uh, get in touch with Gabriella, who I'm sure will be absolutely delighted to talk you through uh, what more uh, the Institute can do to, to help you. Um, so lots of good stuff going on. Right, I'm going to come back to our final question then. And um, this uh, takes us away from COP26 numerically to COP27, which is due to happen in Sharm El Sheikh next year. Um, and really, it's, it's a question you know, of we've, we've achieved some stuff with COP26. 12 months, we're all going to congregate again in a slightly sunnier location than Glasgow. Um, what are our hopes? What are our uh, aspirations? What do we think is going to happen what do we need to happen in the next 12 months? Bill, I'm relying on you to give us your perspectives on this. Yes, well, I mean, you know, strengthening targets need to be presented. Well, uh, and that's really important, you know, uh, by governments and their new set of NDCs. I mean, that was one of the specific actions for governments for the next year and to report back at the next COP. Um, just reflecting on the, you know, COPs and geopolitics and diplomacy. Yeah, I mean, the COP is the conference of parties where 197 countries with their signatories to the Paris Agreements come together for a fortnight, and then there's this other ongoing activity. The other part that's, that's important is that the host government and the diplomacy that they uh, undertake in the run up to COP. And, you know, Prime Minister Johnson, um, he did actually stick his neck out and um, he embraced the topic and uh, appointed a minister. And when the, you know, the UK government and the Foreign Office get into action, they, they can be quite good at diplomacy, at getting other, engaging with other countries on a government to government basis and through their participation in things like the G7 group of countries and the G20 group of countries, they, they have relationships and, and that's, that's really important. I read in, in preparing for this that the UK government continues to hold a presidency until the actual COP meeting starts in Egypt. I, I don't know quite how that works and whether, whether the energy will be there in UK government uh, or whether they've had their moment in the limelight. But clearly moving to Egypt is a, is a different geopolitical dynamic and it's, uh, it's, it's opportune in that it's a country in the south with uh, different needs and, um, and different geopolitical connections. So, so let's hope that's all beneficial. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, you know, we, I think Scott said he didn't expect very much of COP26. And if we, he was on the call, I suspect he might say the same thing about COP27. So it's all the other stuff that's really important. Uh, industry engaging and getting into action in deploying uh, these tools that we've got, these technologies. Thank you, Bill. Uh, Rohit, COP27, what are, what are we wanting to see from uh, the assembled hordes when they, when they come together uh, next year? Yeah, I mean, it, it's going to be quite an interesting year. Um, not this one, the next one. Uh, hopefully recovering from the pandemic, hopefully, uh, unless and until more waves come. Um, and that is going to put a lot of stress upon this, um, especially because this is going to impact the economies of every nation. How that recovery happens and how this then lets the local governments, the national governments work 
and also the entrepreneurs because they are also not uh, i mean many entrepreneurs are not able to make business so this is going to impact um let's say the climate change side of things with renewables and all those things um and and the decisions that they make at their end uh, for climate change for renewables that would also be impacted yes the politics is there the geopolitics is there that is also something we would see how that pans out in the next uh, let's say 12 months from now um we have already seen how geopolitics works uh, in this whole year that we have seen covid is a very good example and vaccines are a very good reference point where people initially wanted to donate vaccines from the us to the india and then when the waves came and hit them hard then people were against the government why are you giving away vaccines we need it, need it for ourselves same thing same attitude same behavior would also be all there for climate change for renewables and so on it's it's just terrible that unfortunately the developing world doesn't have the access to vaccines and doesn't have act, access to money and technology for renewables either so i draw a lot of parallels from there and i i do not want to go in between you know comparing between the uk presidency for cop and and, and the uk prime minister with the government in egypt of course there are different powers how the diplomacy will play out we we have to see there uh, that would come later okay thank you rohit uh john yeah it's uh, obviously the first thing we want to see is uh, a bit more detailed planning a bit more how they're going to achieve some of these rather uh, vague statements and uh, i think that probably will happen but also like to see more collaboration more cooperation between countries um of the scale i see somebody picked up as well again about the moroccan uh, uk uh voltage high voltage line the way that uh, morocco can sell electricity generated by pv to britain but it could be sold closer to morocco um that's just obviously one nation looking around for where they can obtain the power i'd like to see a lot more of that sort of collaboration we don't necessarily need the whole grid connected across the world but i would hope to see a lot more collaborations in these big areas um a bringing of nations that don't have the amount of investment needed to take a really big part of it as well so that they can actually benefit from it so mm. uh, collaboration in all its forms i i have to say john that's something i share with you and i do think that we have such an uh, incredible solar resource available around the equator to enable those nations that are located within that catchment area to to benefit from what that can do i i think that has to be part of um you know our, our global plan uh, as we move forward so uh, brilliant okay um well we're we're approaching um the closing point of our discussions today uh i've got one or two closing remarks um to add but before i do that my heartfelt thanks to john to bill to rohit and in his absence to scott for their their contributions to to this round table and the previous one uh i've very much uh, been inspired by everything that you've said uh, i've taken a lot more uh, to heart than possibly you you would realize and you know i'm incredibly grateful to you all for giving up your time uh, and supporting this activity whilst i'm saying thank you as well big thank you to the team at the REI for hosting this event um both round tables have been incredibly well supported uh, and we do hope you you've enjoyed um being with us and sharing our thoughts and reflections so my, my final remark is something that, that Scott said earlier he was talking about t-shirts um and he said you know there is no planet 2 which uh, that really actually resonates quite deeply we've got one shot at this and we're doing a great job of missing the target completely if nothing else covid has proved to me that human beings are capable of making substantial changes and whilst we haven't got it fully right and we have certainly not organized the, <coughs> the 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 global distribution of the vaccine we've proved that we can mobilize science we've proved that we can mobilize uh the academic community the development community supply chains in ways that we hadn't previously imagined and no we haven't got it fully right but we have proved we can make those substantial steps if we're motivated to do that the fact that cop26 has driven home the need for individuals to become accountable and for governments to recognize that their 
their voters, their electorate want to make this change now. That's really important to see. Uh, so whilst we may have not achieved everything we wanted to with COP26, we have, if nothing else, made that point and governments are now recognising that the voters are seeing uh, this is change we have to make. We, we have no option. 2030, uh, the IPCC reports uh, quite clear on this. If we don't get our emissions under control by then, we're on a potentially terminal trajectory. Um, we've got to work really, really hard. And I know through the work we're doing with the REI and in our, our day jobs, we're all passionate about this. And I really do hope that we will be inspired to, to take this work forward and work really hard and fast to deliver these climate change uh, activities and actions that we absolutely have to do. There is no planet to. Thank you, everybody, for taking the time to be with us. Uh, thank you uh, for participating. Those questions we've not managed to answer, we will get some answers back to you from, from the team. And in the meantime, um, yeah, look forward to meeting you out and about in the world as we continue uh, saving the, the species. Take care, and we'll talk to you all again soon. Bye-bye.